It happens. You think, I, you think I'm only doing it to amuse myself? I'm preparing you. Okay, <clears throat> trivia question. Little, little riddle for you. What are you, what are you happy to lose every night, but reluctant to find every morning? And the answer is consciousness. You, how do you know it right away? Because the unit's on consciousness. So consciousness is the one thing you're happy to lose every night. All right, what are you happier to do? Find consciousness in the morning or lose it at night? Lose it at night because sleep is so rare. And that's part of today's, it's part of this unit is sleep, consciousness, hypnosis, and uh, consciousness altering drugs. And so if you take certain drugs, will certain drugs make you sleep or they make you unconscious? And is there a difference? It's a good question. Consciousness in psychology is one of these things like emotion. We don't know what it is. And even if we did, if I give you a perfect definition, you know there's going to be a problem with it. It's like emotion. It's like intelligence. It's like abnormal. It's like thoughts. We can't perfectly define it, and if we can't perfectly define it, it's going to be hard to measure. And I'll go a step further. Consciousness and the questions about it existed way before Wilhelm Wundt started psychology. You can imagine cave people sitting around and being like, whoa, are you thinking what I'm thinking? And that's a crazy question. How do you know what other people are thinking? How do you know what you're thinking? How do you know you even are thinking? And when you daydream, is that thinking? And if you're not thinking, according to Descartes, you don't exist. Go ahead. If psychology is so, like, I'm sorry, uh, consciousness is such a loose term, then how can you get uh, an expert uh, I would suggest the same way that someone can be an expert in theoretical physics. It's all theory. Let's jump on to this stuff. So we don't know what it is, okay? But we can get close to it by, by looking at some of the frameworks, the theoretical frameworks of what do exist. I'm not saying you can look up a definition in, in a, a dictionary, but we're going to kind of ask around it. We're going to whittle away much as Michelangelo did to David, and hope, hopefully whatever we're left with, just like when someone asked Michelangelo, how did you sculpt that amazing sculpture of David? And he said, it's easy. I just chipped away all the stuff that wasn't part of the statue. Maybe we could chip away all the stuff that's not consciousness, and what we're left with is a pretty close approximation to it. What if I said an awareness of our world and our mental processes? It's a pretty good definition. An awareness of the world and our mental processes. Well, an awareness of the world, well, we know about that from the sensation unit. We can see, we can hear, we can touch, we can taste, we can smell. We, know, we even know where the horizon is because you can close your eyes and you have a sense of balance. So maybe we have six senses, eyes, ears, tongue, nose, skin, and our vestibular sense. Okay. So we know the world exists. But what is this thing called awareness? Oh, that's easy. That's just consciousness. See, now we're just kind of trading synonyms. We're not defining it. All right, I got it. I got it. I got it. Here we go. We're going to take out the word awareness, and we're going to put in the word attention. It's attention to the world and our mental processes. We'll define attention. Oh, it's awareness. What's awareness? It's consciousness. What's consciousness? It's attention. I think you get the problem with this. And even if you could perfectly define a synonym, I double dog dare you to define this thing called mental processes. So we have a really good definition with lots of words that have many syllables. That's impressive. But we haven't gotten anywhere. And we're going to find this again. So a straight ahead attack, what is it? Let's write down the definition. Probably not our best bet. So let's look at a little bit more. Let's look at who doesn't have consciousness. If we, instead of finding what consciousness is, let's find out what it's not. Let's look at dogs. And do you think, a lot, how many of y'all got a dog? How many of y'all love your dog? So here's the question, all right, is your dog aware? Now, you, all of you should say, well, how do you define awareness? Hmm, I don't think a dog is conscious, and here's a, a measure. What we might want to do is put a mirror in front of your dog. And if you put a big mirror in front of your dog, your dog can get down, freaking attack the mirror, like, I'll get you, strange dog that looks like me that anticipates my every move, and then the dog running around trying to attack the mirror image. I'm not sure your dog, if your dog can't recognize itself in a mirror, can your dog recognize itself in its thoughts? I don't think so. Go ahead. This is true. It's because they don't look in the mirror every day. 
But a baby who was shown a mirror can be like, dude, you know, they can figure it out. Like, Whoa. Maybe chimpanzees, maybe dolphins, if you put a little spot of ink on their forehead and show them a mirror, they'll be like, they can't see it. You don't believe me. Everyone right now, look at your forehead. Somebody, where'd it go? You're kind of scared. Did you ever see the SpongeBob where Patrick is sitting there all sad? Because <laughs> you can see his forehead. It kind of makes me laugh. <laughs> Patrick makes us laugh. Hey, Patrick, are you angry too? Yeah. What's the matter? I can't see my forehead. What's your problem? So the question is, let's look at what dogs don't have. And I don't know that they have consciousness. So, all right, maybe dogs are pretty dumb. Let's look at another species that's got a bigger or more developed prefrontal cortex. Chimpanzees. Are they aware? I think they are more social creatures. They have more, uh, is consciousness a function of the number of neurons in your prefrontal cortex? If so, maybe chimps have crossed that threshold and they have enough to be aware of themselves and of others. All right, do dolphins have it? Yeah. Elephants will notice that spot and they'll stare at a mirror like, wow, that's me, but I have a spot, but I didn't put it there. How'd it get there? But I know it's me. We don't know what this thing awareness is, but we know who does have it or who doesn't have it. But let's talk about this. Robots. Now, back in the day, I had a little robot, a Roomba, went around, swept up and vacuumed my hardwood floor. It was kind of cool. All right. I glued little eyes on it. And I had two little, two little kids at the time. The judge says they might not be mine. So I'm like, score. No, just kidding. <laughs> Why would I say that? That's not nice. So we glued two googly eyes on it. And we named the Roomba Dobby. All right, where's my Harry Potter dorks? You're like, oh, Dobby. All right, so here's the way it works. Dobby was going around and Dobby would sweep the floor. And my kids, little girls would follow it around. And they were all happy. And, they'd think. and then here's the interesting thing. When the Roomba or your laptop got tired, it said battery alert. Your laptop would put up the screen, plug in alternative power. The room would go back to its little charging station. The, your laptop can know when it's connected to the internet and when it's not connected to the internet. Is that an awareness of the outside world? The Roomba could know when it bumped into a wall. When it came to stairs, the Roomba could know when it was dirt. Is that awareness? It knew it's getting tired or didn't have batteries. Interesting enough, when a power surge hit it and fried the thing. I right, threw it away. And my girls at the time were really, really young. Like, they were crying. Like, no. They thought it was alive. Was it? This is an interesting question. If we ever get to the point, and I think we will, and probably will in your lifetime, but not me, because we know when I'm going to die in 2019. The old woman of the crystal ball said so. Who am I to doubt? Nice. I didn't look. It's pretty cool, because then why would I ever pay off, pay off my credit cards? <laughs> All right, so check this out. If we ever get to this thing called artificial intelligence, and I think we will in your lifetime, and some person, MIT, Carnegie Mellon, or maybe someone who's bored in a basement, like, oh my God, I did it. The computer is alive. Do you think the computer will thank them? Will the computer be like, holy crap, I'm really bored in this CPU. Connect me to the internet. Hmm, what happens if you turn it off? What happens if you unplug it? You created consciousness, but we don't know what that is. It's a wild concept. All right, and we know that if you ever create a computer and connect it to the internet, it's going to be bad. No science fiction movie where a robot ever becomes aware ends, ends well for human beings. All right, so look, we know, that zo we know that dogs probably don't have it. Chimpanzees on the fence, computers we don't know. Let's look at someone we know is not conscious. All right, and we're going to call that person a zombie. Now look. The zo zombies are in, you know, in vogue nowadays. Everyone's zombie. We've got World War Z. We've got The Walking Dead. We've got a bunch of cool zombie stuff going on. But the zombie question actually predates a lot of the zombie fad. And you can't walk around without seeing some of the t-shirt like, are you prepared for the zombie apocalypse and stuff like that. If we look at what a zombie does, a zombie has purposeful behavior. They walk towards a goal. They are hungry. They can sense the world. What does a zombie not have that we do? What's the difference? And if we can find that out, and again, this predates the zombie fad, but it's a pretty good question. Zombie is as close in mythological or fictional literature to human without being human. What does a zombie not have? Okay, a soul. 
So what does a zombie not have? It can walk, it can talk. This is an interesting question. So we're trying to define what it is that something doesn't have that we do. Let's roll on. What if we were to simply say, what if we were to simply say that we define consciousness as ourself? The little person in our head that takes an info and processes it. When you were a little kid, did you ever think that who you are, who your brain was, or who your mind was, you had a little robot in there, an animal in there, a little someone controlling levers and buttons and dots? A lot of little kids will think that. It's called the homunculus idea. And it predates, of course, modern thought. But the idea is whoever is in your brain, your mind, yourself controls you, a remote control. You are, your body is being remote controlled by something. Okay. You can imagine a little child say, well, the man in my head made me do it. Okay. Well, then the question is, who's in the little man in your head? Who's in that person's head? Where does it end? Some people say, I remember when I was a little kid, I used to think that like, there were mice, and it was like the Starship Enterprise, and different people would control my body by pressing the little buttons, and there was a captain and stuff like that. You're like, that's kind of weird. But it's a common thing for children to think that something else controls them. Now the question is, what controls that something else? You don't believe me? Let's look at a video. When we talk about zombies, it's an interesting psychological trivia question, something called Cotard's disease, Cotard syndrome. It's an extremely rare situation where someone actually thinks they're dead, or they're a zombie, or they're undead. And it doesn't hit everyone the exact same way, but imagine if you couldn't feel a part of your body, or if you had diminished sensory information, and you had diminished what's called affective response or emotional response. You couldn't feel much from your body. You don't have depth or, uh, or vivid emotions. And maybe, just maybe, you also have a neurological hiccup in your parietal lobe so you feel like you're not in your body, like you're floating somewhere away from it. Wrap all those things together and you could have the concept where someone walks around and thinks they're dead. I don't think I'm ever going to test you on it. But remember, if your brain is the seat of your awareness and there are small wrinkles, hiccups, or damage to your brain, maybe it's going to change how you see yourself. Maybe you will feel dead. Let's talk about this thing called theory of mind. Look, I went to all the trouble to highlight this and put it in like a weird font so you know it's important. That's teaching right there. I highlighted something with different colors and you think I don't care about you. So let's talk about theory of mind. Theory of mind is the idea that we believe others think. We believe that others are aware. And I'm not sure a dog has it. If you think that you know, you're sad or you're sick and your dog comes up and licks you and your dog, oh, my dog knows I'm sad. I'm not sure that's true. I think you're right. I think that's projecting your emotions, because check this out. For a dog to know you're sad, a dog has to know what sadness is. Does a dog know what sadness is? When he's sad. When he's sad. Do, do dogs get sad? Yeah. When they're not eating. Okay, you're assuming when they're not eating, eating if we're going to put on B.F. Skinner's hat, it'll be a pretty big hat, because I'll show you pictures of B.F. Skinner later, and he might have the biggest head I've ever seen in the history of the universe. You think I'm lying. So you put on B.F. Skinner's hat, which is about this big. And he's going to say this, there's no such thing but behavior. So we see a dog whimpering. How do we know the dog's not in pain? The dog's not sad, it's in pain. I don't know if dogs have an emotion, but if dogs do, can a dog recognize the emotion it has, we're having? That's a pretty big leap. Now humans can do it. Are we born with that ability? I don't know. Go ahead. Last night I was on Vine and I saw Vine. Whoa, 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 slow down. You were on what now? Who, huh? Vine. Okay, proceed. And Pretend I'm really old and just playing with Vine is. It's just like six-second videos. Okay, that's fair enough. Go ahead. And there was, it was a Vine of a husky, like, crying on his, his, his like, owner's graveyard. Okay. All right. We hear all these neo torpedo things of, of a dog trying to, you know, laying down the, on the owner's grave or a dog missing someone and they're gone or something like that. Here's my problem with this. 
if we're going to be a skeptical scientist, the only thing we're looking at is behavior. We're not, we're, we're trying to suggest a dog thinks like humans. Before we do that, I want us to think like a dog. When a dog does something, we're like, oh, he misses me. No, he's hungry. That's it. All you are to your dog is a large, awkwardly shaped food dispenser. And all your dog is to you, let's face it, is a mobile stuffed animal. That's pretty much it. Go ahead. But like this isn't a dog, but like before they get sent to like slaughterhouses and like when they're like about to like descend into like the eating like the like, 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 cows cry. Cows cry. Yeah. Okay. I'm and not they, like know that they're like about to die. If we're going to be scientific, I will acknowledge that cows cry. Or it should be like some like deep song where some teenagers like, oh, cows cry. Whatever. <laughs> so, I will acknowledge cows cry, but we have to be careful of ascribing the reason. We have to be careful of ascribing theory of mind. Okay? Could a cow be afraid and anticipate the future? Maybe. But is it possible the cow is crying? For a reason we'll never know because we can't think like a cow. So what we have to do is be careful to say a dog knows. Because I'm not sure human beings know. I double dog dare you to teach a three-year-old. All right? I double dog dare you to teach a two-year-old not to hit. Two-year-old's mad. <laughs> and then don't hit. And the two-year-old and you say and the two-year-old's like, well, why? And you say this thing that blows your mind. How would you like it if you were hit? And you're like, whoa, you mean. When I feel pain, it's the same thing what I do when someone else, when I hit them? Whoa, you mean, that's an amazing leap to connect our emotions with someone else. Can a dog do that? I don't know. Can a dog be in love? No Disney references, please. Oh, it's so, so the reality is, theory of mind simply means we're connected mentally. We can anticipate other people's mental events. So why would I put autism here? Well, if we're looking at theory of mind, theory of mind suggests we can anticipate what other people think and other people feel. Can a dog do it? I don't know. Can a computer do it? Not yet. Maybe we don't want them to. And that's, that's the whole thing. Whenever we look at any kind of thing where they make an android or a robot or someone who's perfectly logical, the thing is that thing cannot anticipate our emotion. Now, when we look at autism, this is an interesting way of looking at consciousness because if someone who has extreme autism cannot anticipate what someone else is feeling, can they explain what they're feeling? If they're not aware of other people's thoughts, are they aware of their own thoughts? Now that's an interesting question because if someone isn't aware of their own thoughts, are they conscious or are they reacting? Now, I'm treading on thin ice here because I don't in any way, shape, or form want to suggest that people with autism don't have thoughts, don't have emotions, and aren't connecting. They are, they are, they are, they are, in a different way, maybe in a delayed way, but it is an interesting way to look at consciousness. My next thing is many of y'all are struggling right now to pay attention. Is your thought or your state of consciousness right now just a mix of 180 neurotransmitters? And if so, what if we could exactly duplicate and replicate what is going on in your synapses and put it in someone else's synapses. Would they have the same consciousness and level of awareness as you? Is consciousness just chemical? So when I say, hey, pay attention back there, be like, be more interesting. The reality is, is consciousness just chemicals? You can't help it. Everyone right now, release more testosterone, go. All the guys are like, mm. wow, that's pretty strong. All right, ladies, have more estrogen, go. Gentlemen, I want you to have more adrenaline, get amped. If you can't do it, then can you control your consciousness? If consciousness is just chemical and we have no control of chemicals, then do we have control over consciousness? Maybe daydreaming, a teacher should never ever say pay attention. Maybe the student should look back straight now and say, I can't. I need these two minutes to zone out, to not be conscious. It is normal, it is natural. There is one student right now who is not reading this because that student is daydreaming. What type of consciousness? Who, I, oh, the one time I say this, everyone's paying attention. <laughs> Sicking me. Oh, you know, I can't even follow directions to not pay attention. All right, so let's do this. What is daydreaming? Is daydreaming something that happens or is it something that doesn't happen? It's kind of like this. If you're driving a car, it's slowing down 
Is it the application of the brakes or is it letting off the accelerator? All right, look, when you daydream, you're usually going to daydream about stuff that's familiar to you. You're going to daydream about stuff you have to do. Sometimes it's stressful. You're going to day Very few people are going to daydream like a pink elephant on a freaking tightrope with a skateboard and a laptop in a convertible. I don't know. Maybe you are like, oh, dude, I had that thing. All right. If that's your, then you got issues because what is your normal life like? Because we daydream about stuff that's familiar. I would like you to not daydream. Okay. So after you copy this down, slam your pens down and I'm not going to say anything for 30 seconds. I'm not going to teach. And I want you to not daydream. I want you to keep reading those words over and over again. All right, slam your pens down. Okay, ready? Go. 30 seconds. I won't even say don't daydream because if I tell you not to daydream, you're going to think of my words and you're going to daydream about what I'm saying. So I'm just going to not say anything. I'm the kind of guy that when I say I'm not going to say anything, I'm not going to say All right, raise your hand when you start daydreaming. All right, and stop. I think everyone here daydreamed. Or did you? No. Define That's a good question, define daydreaming. Does anyone here have a favorite daydream you kind of get into or play in your mind over and over again like a, a movie? All right, we got a couple people. Is anyone here like, you can do that? Thought suppression rebound is the more you, th more you try to suppress the thought, the more you think of it. And I'll demonstrate. Instead of me describing thought suppression rebound, here's what I want you to do. Um, I want you to think of, be mindful of your breathing. How you normally breathe. Do you normally breathe in through your nose? Or do you normally breathe in through your mouth? Now, if you do, I want you to breathe in through your nose. Now, do you normally breathe deeply or shallowly? And then how long do you hold it? Do you breathe in? And, and then, like, when should you let it go? How deep should you take it? How often do you breathe? Okay, so here's what I want you to do. We got a pretty good figure of it. Now I want you to not think of your breathing. Ready, go. Then you're not thinking about it? You're like, oh, wait. oh, damn, I'm still thinking about it. You're all kind of upset. All right, are you still thinking about it? Has anyone here totally forgotten about your breathing? But by raising your hand, didn't you just remind yourself of it? If we can't define consciousness, what about unconsciousness? We have certain automatic processes, all right? And the, and the deal is we can't control what happens in our brain a lot. So I want you to not automatically and unconsciously read this word. She said hi. <laughs> all right, the reality is we automatically and unconsciously, or maybe it was conscious. I, want, I wanted you to consciously try to process it bottom up. I wanted you to see vertical lines, horizontal line, horizontal line, vertical lines, vertical line, horizontal, vertical, horizontal, and then of course we have a circle. You didn't see that. You automatically, unconsciously processed. Can we automatically, can, can we control that? If we can control our unconscious processes, would we have greater control over our life, over our thoughts? You ever gotten mad for no reason? Oh, there's a reason. You're just unconscious of it. You're unaware of it. You ever been mad at your mom for no reason? all the time. Are you mad at your mom for a conscious reason? No, of course not. But why do you get mad? If you can figure that out, will you have better control of your life? Trying to figure out what's in the unconscious is pretty tough. All right, can't talk about unconscious without talking about Freud. Freud said the unconscious mind was kind of sneaky, was manipulative, intelligent, and steered our behavior into thoughts that it wanted to go, but the right thinking, noble, moral conscious part of our mind steered it away. So no, we don't want to think about those thoughts. Those are, ooh, those are gross, those are sinful, those are immoral. But our unconsciousness steered us back. Have you ever had a thought that grossed you out? Where did that come from? It came from you. Oh, you've got it in you. You've got some freaky things in you. I'm like, no, I don't. That's disgusting. Oh, really? You ever said something that offended somebody? I didn't mean it. It just slipped out. All right, maybe it slipped out, but where did, it, where did it come from in the first place? Who manufactured that, that hateful, hurtful thought? You did. This is why it's called the Freudian slip. If you don't know what a Freudian slip is, 
All right. A Freudian slip is when you write this down. It's when you say one thing but mean your mother. How many of you all have ever said several minutes after a joke? I get that. <laughs> kind of embarrassing. All right. If we're talking about Freudian unconscious, we have to know about repression. Now, whether or not repression is real or not, what we have to be aware of is if repression's real, well, how do we study it? We can't even study the conscious. How are we going to study the unconscious? So there's a squishy thing called consciousness. We don't know what it is. We can't define. And of the conscious, there's even like a worse thing because now there's a squishy thing we can't define that's hidden and invisible and doesn't want to be found. That's tough. And how do we know of it? Well, we don't know, but the thought is repression. All of the things we're not aware of do exist, but one part of our mind doesn't want to know what is really going on deep in there. Remember that thing that really, really bothered you? Nope, because you repress it. Anyone here afraid of something? Anyone got a phobia? You don't have to say it, but if, if you raise your hand, I'm going to call on you. Go ahead. Spiders. Okay. Here is a theory. She's not afraid of spiders. All right. She's afraid of something, but she can't know what it is because her mind doesn't want to know what was so scary back in the day. So she took her fear and unconsciously put it on spiders. Maybe she saw something really bad or someone hurt her feelings or something like that right at the same time she saw a spider. Maybe spiders represent something that's scary. Of course, she's pretty sure because she doesn't know what the real reason is and she doesn't want to know. And you're going to hold on. She's like, no, -uh, I know. Do you? Consciously, you know. Okay. This is not like uh, classroom psychology. It's not therapy. It's the things that bother you. The real reason you repress. And you're only conscious of things that are okay to be afraid of. It is okay in normal society to be afraid of spiders. Nobody likes spiders. When you see a spider, you're not like, oh, here you go, little fella. You're like, yeah. <laughs> Don't say you're not. You're afraid of your mom for no reason. Maybe there is a reason. Maybe you don't remember the time when you were four years old. And you're like, Mommy, do you like my drawing? She's like, Honey, not now. I'm busy. And, like, eh. and you ran away screaming. You realize your mom would rather do something else than pay attention to you. That was a tectonic punch in the face emotionally to a four-year-old. But you can't handle it. So what do you do? You take all that stuff, you put it down. And every time your mom gets busy, you get mad. But you don't know why you're mad at her because she's busy. Because you don't remember it. Because you repress it. Because it was scary. Do you believe this? Some of you are like, Whoa. Let's talk about Freudian slip. Actually, instead of talking about Freudian slip, how about we show a quick video? And it breaks my heart to see the loss of innocent life and to see brave, brave troops in combat lose their life. It just breaks my heart. But I understand what's going on. These people are trying to shake the will of the Iraqi citizens, and they want us to leave. That's what they want us to do. And I think the world would be better off if we did leave. If we, didn't, if, we, if, if we left, the world would be worse. The world is better off with us not leaving. It's a mistake to pull out. You have something in your eye? You want to take it out? All right, fair enough. All right, so... Aha, you have to look at yourself. So, can we be serious for one second? It happens. You've got to be ready.